All right, guys, welcome to part two of chapter 34 for pediatric emergencies. We're going to pick up right where we left off. So scene size up for a call involving a pediatric patient is much the same as it is for an adult. However, there are some key differences. One, if you know there's a child involved, especially if it's a traumatic mechanism, you need to start mentally preparing yourself for what that means and what that's going to look like. Um, it's difficult for us to see children injured. It's not pleasant for us to experience that. And so if you are surprised by that, that can hurt you as the responder. Now, sometimes we can't avoid that. Sometimes we don't know that a child is involved. But if you hear a child being involved on an initial dispatch or something like that, begin thinking about mentally preparing yourself for what that means. Does that mean that you need to review your protocols on pediatric treatments? review a dosage for a medication, albuterol, something like that, that you can administer. Mentally preparing yourself is important. When we are collecting information about the patient, you're still going to collect just like you would for an adult, their age, their gender, where's the scene, their nature, or mechanism of injury, and their chief complaint. Note the position at which the patient is found. You know, look for safety threats, especially for infectious diseases. Make sure you're wearing your PPE, environmental assessments. All of those things are the same. Know that children lose heat faster. They can't maintain their body temperatures as much. So that will be something that you'll need to think about and start thinking about from your initial scene. A young child um, that is either unresponsive or too young to communicate makes assessing, especially a traumatic mechanism, harder. So whenever, that, whenever they're unresponsive or they're too young to communicate, we can assume that the injury was significant enough to cause head or neck injuries if it's there. So always consider C-spine immobilization as appropriate. Know that you won't be able to put them on a full backboard um, with the same adult size straps depending on what equipment that you have to backboard them. Make sure you have an appropriately sized C-collar. Make sure that you have everything that you need to take care of that patient and bring that out with you to your scene. And that's something that you get from your scene size up. One of the most important assessment tools that we have when it comes to pediatrics is the Pediatric Assessment Triangle or the PAT. It is a three-sided assessment approach that allows you to look and determine the initial life threats based off of their appearance, their work of breathing, and their circulation to the skin. In general, this can be performed in less than 30 seconds. So the PAT does not require equipment. You don't need a pulse oximeter. You don't need a blood pressure cuff. You just need to look at them. And there are the three steps, appearance, work of breathing, and circulation. From those findings, you will use that to determine if the patient is stable or unstable. Now, that's not to say that other vital signs, their actual pulse rate, their oxygen saturation, their blood pressure are not important, but the primary assessment is done with that PAT first. We can look and see, are they working hard to breathe? Are, is their mental status depressed? Is their appearance bad? Are they showing those skin signs of shock as those initial signs set in? If they're unstable, we're going to assess the ABCs further, treat any life threats that we have, and transport immediately, not necessarily in that order. If they're stable, you can remain on scene and continue your assessment as normal. So, for a pediatric patient, you will need to perform a hands-on ABC assessment. You can't always just determine the ABCs just by looking or listening at them. The older patients you can, the older pediatric patients you absolutely can, but especially on infants and toddlers and preschoolers, you may need to be more hands-on looking in their mouth, following the ABCDE format. If the airway is open initially, fortunately for us, most of the time their airway will remain open. So assess their ventilatory adequacy, make sure they're breathing at an okay level, make sure that they're actually oxygenating that. If they're unresponsive or you have difficulty keeping their airway open, you can suction, you can try to clear the mouth of any foreign bodies, any blood, any vomit, mucus, especially mucus in younger kids, 
Always think of those. Manage the airway aggressively because, again, their airways are, are small. They're tiny. So if you get ahead of that, you're golden. If you get behind the curve on managing their airway, that will just get worse as you go along and they may go into respiratory arrest. For breathing, we use a look, listen, and feel technique. You can place your hands on their chest, on the uh, anterior chest wall. That'll help you not only ascertain how quickly they're breathing, but also their volume. You can look for those retractions. You can look for any, like, let's say, intercostal retractions or clavicular retractions specifically. Anytime that a pediatric patient is bradypneic, you need to be concerned because they should not be breathing slowly. Consult your book for the normal vital signs and the normal respiratory rates by age. So circulation, so we're looking for the same sorts of things. We're looking for any obvious bleeding. Do they have a pulse? Is it strong? Are they having skin signs that show you that they're going into shock? Can you palpate a brachial or femoral pulse in an infant? Can you palpate a carotid pulse in a child older than one year? Are they strong? Are they weak? Are they bounding? Are they regular or irregular? Those are all things that you can uh, get out of the circulation assessment. And just because um, they have good central pulses doesn't mean they will have good peripheral pulses, but fortunately for us, a strong central pulse okay, usually indicates that the child is not hypotensive. So sometimes you might not be able to easily assess the blood pressure on an infant or a child, but if they have a strong central pulse, then they're probably not hypotensive. Right? If they have weak or absent peripheral pulses, especially in older patients, um, that may indicate a decreased level of perfusion to those areas. So tachycardia can be an early sign of hypoxia. As I said in the other one, kids can compensate for shock pretty well for quite a while, but then they fall off of a cliff. So be very cognizant of even the slightest signs of shock in a kid because they're probably further along that shock pathway than they appear. Use your pulse reading within the context of their overall history, your primary assessment, and the pediatric assessment triangle. See if you can see a trend, whether or not their pulse is increasing or decreasing. Cap refill time in particular, I can't go back now, but um, cap refill time in particular is important for pediatrics. They should have a cap refill of less than two seconds. The D in ABCDE is for disability. So check their level of response on the AVPU and pediatric GCS. Consult your book for those charts. Check their pupillary response. This should be the same as it is in adults. Look for symmetrical movement in their extremities. Pediatric stroke is a thing that occurs, and it occurs more often than we might think. So make sure that you're aware of those signs and symptoms, and if you see um, asymmetric movement of extremities, think neuro. Okay? And while you're doing the assessment, especially of pain, you have to consider the developmental age of the patient in order to give you an idea of, is the information that they're giving you reliable? So sometimes, and the E in ABCDE is for exposure, sometimes you will need to remove or move some clothing. Um, let the caregiver do that, okay? The child will be more comfortable. Know that they are more prone to hypothermic events, so not only when you're exposing them should you keep them warm during transport, but at any other time. Wrap them in a blanket. This can make your life a little bit easier because if they're wrapped in a blanket and you need to reassess them physically, hands-on, it can be easier to assess them um, if you don't have to pull up a shirt when you can just open up a blanket. Transport decision is the same. You're still going to determine whether or not they need a trauma center. You need to consider things like is there a dedicated pediatric facility that you have access to that is within reasonable distance? If so, the patient should go there. Here in Albuquerque, the university is the only dedicated pediatric emergency department. Um, all the other hospitals except the VA can accept pediatrics, but UNM really is the best place for that. 
And Zoe is shoving her face up in here, so she wants some pets. We'll give her that. All right. So also consider what type of problem are they having. That will also alter your transport decision. Do they need a trauma center? Do they need a cardiac center? Do they have special underlying medical conditions and histories? Congenital cardiac abnormalities? Are there specialists somewhere that they're already dealing with? All things that you should think about. Of course, always go by your local protocols and the transport times. Zoe really wants to be in on this lecture, don't you? Yes, you do. <laughs> All right. However, if they're unstable and urgent and emergent, transport them to the closest appropriate facility. We also have to think about in our transport decision, do we have the right equipment to transport them? Patients less than 40 pounds should be transported in a car seat. Um, it should be mounted to the stretcher facing backwards and using the proper equipment. Okay. A, a lot of agencies will have child seats, but sometimes that might not be the correct size. If the parent or guardian has the correct size seat that can be safely mounted to the gurney, usually you'll do that, but make sure you've got all the pieces. If a chair, if, if, if a child seat usually uses a base that it sits into, use that. They are not safe and not designed to sit just by themselves. Okay. I talked a little bit before about spinal immobilization. Make sure you've got the right equipment for that. Make sure if you're going to use a long board that they are the correct size or you have the correct size long board. We generally don't want to use their own car seat if we have to um, transport them. Though, like I said before, in extenuating circumstances, you may do that. But in general, we do not want to use their car seat. Um, if you're transporting a pediatric patient that's in cardiac arrest, use something that can be secured to the stretcher because it will be harder to secure them to the stretcher. The goal is, of course, is to secure and protect the patient during transport. So our approach to history taking really varies depending on their age, whether or not we're going to get most of it from their caregiver or if we can get some of it from the patient. At all times with pediatric patients, we should be trying to gather information from both because sometimes people lie. And so you need all the information you can to start synthesizing um, the actual history of the present illness and what went on. Also, younger children may not know about their medical history. They may know that they take medicine, but they might not know what they take it for. So the parents are a uh, invaluable asset to that. So just like with an adult, we're going to ask questions based upon their mechanism or their nature of their illness. All the same questions apply. How long have they been sick? What was going on leading up to that? Have they had a fever? What effects of an injury are they having? What is their activity level in context of their normal level? And especially with younger patients, what are their eating and drinking habits been? Are they creating wet diapers or are they not putting out urine? Other things to consider, changes in bowel and bladder habits, especially in older ones. Are they having diarrhea? Are they having constipation? Have they gone recently at all? Are they vomiting? Do they have abdominal pain? Look at their skin for signs of a rash. Um, and then do all of your assessment questions based off of that. If a caregiver or parent is not able to be there at scene or come with the patient during transport, get their contact information. The hospital and potentially you may need that. And then we're always going to obtain sample and OPQRST for these patients. Make sure that you're getting these as much as possible on all of your patients, but especially Especially on these pediatrics, you may have to ask both the patient and the caregiver for this information. All right, that's the end of part two. I'll see you in part three.